just to make communication easier. I see we have several people that have already joined the webinar. This is wonderful. It is a very exciting day for us. This is our first presentation for our distinguished lecture series this year. This year we are starting strong with an amazing and world renowned presenter. It's kicking us off well. We first have some housekeeping to go over. We do have interpreters here on the webinar that will provide an ASL interpretation for this, the talk. We also have live captioning. It seems we're still waiting for the live captioner to join. And if they are not able to do so, we will use auto captioning. We recognize that that is not the best. Um, but as soon as we have a live captioner join the webinar, we will switch over to our live captioning. It seems like the captioning agency had a problem with uh, a captioner being ill and needing to be replaced at the last minute. So apologies for that, everyone. For our audience, a few housekeeping notes about this presentation. You will see the chat feature, which is an icon at the bottom of your screen. That is for individuals watching the presentation to connect with one another. Any ideas that you have um, from this talk, if you want to connect and talk about what you're hearing and seeing. We also have a Q&A feature, at the, which is also an icon at the bottom of your screen. And these are places that you can type in questions for this speaker. We will hold all questions until the end of the talk. And if we have time, we will have our presenter, Dr. Damasio, answer those questions. And I always forget to introduce myself. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Alaria Bertoletti. I am the program director for the PhD in Educational Neuro Neuroscience and also director of my individual lab and director for our distinguished lecture series. I will now turn it over to one of our graduate students who will formally introduce the presenter for today, again, who is world renowned. So let me invite Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel Sortino. I'm a graduate student in the PhD in Educational Neuroscience. I'm a third year student. Welcome all to the PhD in Educational Neuroscience Distinguished Lecture Series hosted by Gallaudet University. This lecture series aims to honor world-renowned scientists in the fields of psychology, education, cognitive sciences, and neuroscience. These different fields and all the interdisciplinary fields in between contribute to the new and growing field of educational neuroscience. They increase our understanding of the human mind and the neural mechanisms of learning. This year's Distinguished Lecture Series theme is exploring the foundations of human development and consciousness. I'm honored to introduce our distinguished lecturer today, Dr. Antonio Damasio. He is the Dornsef Professor of Neuroscience, Psychology, and Philosophy, and the Director of the Brain and Creative Institute at USC LA. He's trained as both a neurologist and a neuroscientist. He's made seminal contributions to the understanding of brain processes, the underlying affect, decision-making, and consciousness. His work has made a major impact in neuroscience, psychology, and philosophy. He is the author of several hundred scientific articles and is considered one of the most eminent psychologists of the modern era. He's one of the most cited scientists worldwide with over 250,000 citations on Google Scholar.
Dr. Damasio's recent work addresses the biology of consciousness, the role of life regulation in the generation of cultures, and the problems derived from the non-biological nature of AI. Recent articles include Sensing, Feeling, and Consciousness, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, B, Sensing is a Far Cry from Sentience in Animal sens Sentience, Introception and the Origin of Feelings, a new synthesis in bioessays, as well as a number of other manuscripts included in the link in chat. Damasio's books include Descartes, Descartes' Error, The Feeling of What Happens, Looking for Spinoza, Self Comes to Mind, the Strange Order of Things, and Feeling and Knowledge, which are translated worldwide and taught in numerous universities. Damasio is a member of several academies, among them the National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Academia das Sciences de Lisboa. He's received numerous prizes, among them the Paul McLean Award for Outstanding Neuroscience Research in Psychosomatic Medicine, the International Freud Medal, the Grawmeyer Award, and honorary doctorates from several universities, including the Federal University of Luazan and the Sorbonne. of Paris. Please see the link in chat for a more detailed list of his numerous honors. Today's presentation is entitled The Biology of Feelings and Consciousness. And now please join me in welcoming Dr. Damasio. Very good. Good morning. <clears throat> Great pleasure to be with you or good afternoon. A little bit free. for me it's still morning. Uh, I'm have the uh, honor of talking about one of the most fascinating but at the same time troubling topics uh, in modern science and in philosophy and that is the topic of consciousness uh, it's no exaggeration to say that this is the most contentious topic that you can find in current science and in philosophy so whether you are a biologist or a neurobiologist uh, or you're working in plain psychology or you're a philosopher or you're a general biologist, you will find constant references to consciousness and you will find that those references come with a lot of trouble. Um, and why? Because the topic is clearly complicated. Uh, it opens itself to multiple interpretations. Uh, and when people really come down to it, they cannot agree uh, on what is consciousness to begin with and how consciousness comes about. Uh, it's obvious that everybody links it to the mind. It would be strange if it wouldn't be so. Um, it's clearly related to the brain, although some people might have questions on that. And even within the brain, sciences which clearly present the most dominant theories about what consciousness is and how it comes about there is quite a lot of contention um, i think that in recent years especially in the past couple of years things are coming to a, a greater agreement even if the conflicts are still very uh, open and obvious uh, and i think that in all probability within the next five years, we're going to settle many of these differences and conflicts. So I'm going to give you my opinion. I'm going to give it's an opinion that comes from our research of several years. And just to give you an idea of how complicated the topic is, I can tell you that I myself have held different views on what consciousness is and how it comes about. So if you 
go and read uh, my work around, say, 2010, uh, you will find several distinctions in relation to what I'm saying now. Uh, and that, of course, comes from the research, comes from what I have studied, and comes from what I have reflected on. So if, if one single investigator over a period of, say, 20 years can have notable progress and changes, it really tells you that we're dealing with something very complex. Um, and there's no reason why it shouldn't be so. So let's enjoy the trouble uh, and, and, and go for it. And I'm going to start with a, a set of current definitions of consciousness and then give you the details of how it comes about. What are, what, what, what are the mechanisms behind it? So uh, consciousness in the notes that I have here is the spontaneous, note spontaneous, possession of my mental processes, my mind, such that I know without being told and without having to deduce it, that what I see, what I hear, what I think, and what I feel are my mental processes. So this is, this sounds both complicated and horribly simple. It's really a, an issue of coming to know that our minds, which of course we all have access to, are part of ourselves. It's something private, not to be shared with others. My mind is my mind, your mind. Your minds are your minds. So this, this individuality of mind is very critical. And then it's the idea that this mind process is located in my body. That's actually the great contribution of consciousness is first of all giving us access to the mind and then placing that mind in the body this is not a trivial point because you know it, it could have been that although i have my mind uh, and that my mind would not be in my body but would be floating around no in terms of what we know consciousness is consciousness is the feature of our biology that allows us to place mind inside my body. And now something very important, and this is probably the newest part of my talk, and then I will elaborate on it, is that that knowledge that I have, that my mind is in my body, that the two are together, comes from homeostatic feelings, which describe in the terms of affect, what's going on in my living organism. So I'm, I'm going to pause here just to give you a little bit more. Um, so we all know that we have feelings. And very often what we think when we hear the, the term feeling, we actually think of emotion and we think of feelings of emotion. Like, for example, the feeling of having joy, the feeling of joy, or the feeling of anger, or the feeling of fear. Well, those are feelings of these complicated processes known as emotions. I'm not going to be talking about that. I'm talking about homeostatic feelings, the feelings that describe the state of my being, feelings that uh, give you a sense, for example, of, a, of your body temperature, feelings that give you a sense of your respiration, uh, feelings that give you hunger or thirst or nausea, um, all these feelings that have to do with the state of the body. So those are what I call homeostatic feelings, again, distinct from the emotional feelings. And they are very uh, important because they translate in our minds what's going on in our bodies. That's how we know that we are alive and that we belong in this body the sense, for example, of body temperature or the sense of our uh, cardiac function, our heart beating and blood circulating, or these things that come uh, every once in a while during a day and that tell us very important things like being hungry, telling us that we better do something about eating and feeding ourselves or being thirsty. Um, so these are the homeostatic feelings. And the last thing I have to tell you is that the term homeostatic comes from this big word homeostasis. 
And homeostasis is, describes the regulation of our life. Homeos, to be in a homeostatic state is to be in a state of balance in our own life. And what is so interesting is that feelings are the translators of homeostasis. And when you think about these homeostatic feelings, what they're telling you in no uncertain terms is how life is going in your organism. So when you feel hungry, that's because energy has declined. The sources of energy have declined in your organism and you need to feed yourself. When you're thirsty, it's because the amount of water available in your system is declining and you need to bring that water into the system by drinking so that your homeostasis can continue. In other words, all of these feelings are ways in which life uh, and its regulation is telling you, are things okay? Are things in balance? Or are things going off balance? And that is a very important bit of information. And it's a very important bit of information that, lo and behold, is coming to you spontaneously. When you have a feeling of hunger or thirst or the feeling that you have fever, for example, and your body temperature is increasing, all of those feelings are conscious to begin with, and they are spontaneously conscious. So I'm sort of jumping ahead of myself to give you the main message that I want you to retain, and then we'll elaborate on it. And that is that the way in which consciousness comes about in living human organisms such as we are is by way of homeostatic feelings, which I've just described, because they are, each and every one of them, spontaneously conscious. And so if you ask me, what is consciousness really? Consciousness is the putting together of all these constant instances of homeostatic feelings, which are spontaneously conscious and which are telling you that yes, you are in a body, that body is alive, that body has needs and those needs need to be satisfied. And that body has a certain way of being which can be off balance or in balance. And by the way, when we feel well, we feel well because we are in balance and because a lot of the needs are being met and we are in a state that does not have an immediate requirement such as being very hungry or thirsty or such as having pain, which is a signal that things are not going well and is pointing us again spontaneously and consciously for a part of the body where something is going wrong and you're being alerted to that so that you can do something about it, which can mean if you cut yourself uh, treating the wound or if there's pain that is not explainable, going to a physician to find out what can be wrong with you. So just think of the importance of consciousness because without consciousness, you would not really know what to do in terms of regulating your life. And life is this precious commodity that we have. And if it's not constantly uh, curated, if it's not constantly treated and minded, uh, things can go awry and you're in bad trouble. Okay. So I also wanted to say what consciousness is not so that we don't get confused. And consciousness is not a plain mind process. I, I could say to be colloquial that consciousness is sort of mind plus, is mind plus this knowledge that we have that mind is in the body and this knowledge that get, is given in the form of feeling so that we are affected. You know, remember the word affect. The word affect is, describes all sorts of feelings and emotions and so forth. But it's about the body being affected. It's about the body being in a certain state that is pulled in in a certain direction. That's what consciousness is. It's about affect, it's about feeling, informing us about the state of life. So consciousness is not a plain mind process. Um, 
And consciousness is not just awareness, uh, it's not attention, for example. And the other thing that is important is to say that consciousness is not conscience. Conscience has to do with our ethical sense, with our moral behavior. And very often people hear consciousness and they hear conscience. No, it, it, to, to, to say that a person who is uh, very ethical and, and behaves very morally is a person that is full of consciousness is not right. Consciousness is the specific thing I defined earlier. But conscience and consciousness have the same root. And that's the problem. And it's not so bad in English because there are languages such as Portuguese, French, Italian, where the, the word is the same. So when you say in French conscience, you have to then define if you mean consciousness or if you mean conscience. If you say in Portuguese consciencia or in Spanish conscia or in Italian coscienza, you have again to make that distinction. So it makes life very difficult because you need constantly to define it. In English, fortunately, the word is more separate, but even so, you constantly find uh, uh, this drift and I'm um, alerting you not to do it. So uh, when we look at a mind, we find this constant flow of sensory images uh, that describe uh, the objects that are around us, describe actions. Uh, and uh, that mind, which we generally call extraceptive, is literally looking out into the world, looking around us and bringing us through vision, hearing, touch, uh, to, through smell and, and taste, is bringing us the world. Um, and you know very well about this because in your particular case, because you, your hearing is not operating uh, fully or not operating at all, you have to derive the information about the world from uh, senses such as vision uh, or taste or touch. Uh, and that is very important. But so you, I'm sure you have a very keen uh, way of realizing how important is this operation of looking around and bringing information about the world through the senses. Um, now, what is interesting is that we have, in addition to that, all of these feelings that I was talking about, these feelings that are spontaneously uh, conscious, and our uh, operations of mind in consciousness are really the result of combining these two things, the operations that bring the information of the world around us through senses such as vision, and an information that comes from within the body, and it tells us how the world of our body is operating. And it's very interesting because if, you, if, if you're hearing this, you say, well, that makes perfect sense. There's nothing extraordinary about that, except that most of the time, the definitions of mind that you encounter only concentrate on the outside and leave out the inside, leave out the world of feeling. And it's very important to make this distinction because the world of the outside is portrayed in terms of images. Right now you're looking at me, you're looking at the translator that is doing all the movements that then end up translated in terms of language. Very good. Now, in terms of feeling, this is different because it's not a language of gesture, it's not a language of visual images, it's a language of effect. It's the language that comes from feeling your own body and having a sense if that body has a quality that is good, that is pleasant, that is positive, or a quality that is negative, such as having uh, nausea uh, or, or malaise uh, or disgust. Those are the, the language in which feeling is being given is a language that is different. It's some language. So I think that you in particular, because 
of your uh, uh, keen knowledge of what it is not to have a sense and having to rely on another sense, you will know that we're talking about different languages. And so uh, you, you can see you, you can see the language of effect as a language like sign language. And what the, the way you are um, knowing about that language is not in the form of numbers, it's not in the form of words, it's in the form of feelings. And those feelings have as instruments qualities, good or not so good or bad, and have intensities, very intense or light. That's the way we come into to feeling. And needless to say, all of you listening to me, as well as myself and the translator, know that at any time during the day, we are feeling things. We may, be, we may not pay much attention to the feelings, but we are feeling them. And there is this very big distinction that I like to make between feelings of existence, the feelings that give us our own body uh, and our own life, uh, such as, for example, the feeling of body temperature uh, or the feeling of respiration. And you know, you, you very often don't pay attention to the fact that these things are there, but it takes very little for you to realize that they're there in the big time. Take, for example, body temperature. Uh, right now, presumably, we're all comfortable. I'm comfortable here in my study. I don't have complaints about body temperature. However, if I were to go out in a hot day and suddenly be out in the open uh, with, with a high temperature, I would immediately realize that it's very hot. Or if I would go out in a freezing day and realize it's cold and you would recoil. Or, quite interestingly, if the change in temperature comes from within, such as when you have a fever. If you have a fever, or, or for example, when you are going into anesthesia and your body temperature drops. So uh, all of those differences are very, you know, we're very keenly aware of them when we are experiencing them. Uh, and the same way with the airway. You know, we, we, we tend not to realize that we are breathing constantly, air in, air out. Uh, and we immediately notice it if the airway is constricted. If you are, for if you have a disease such as asthma and you cannot breathe properly, or if you have bronchitis, or if you have pneumonia and you can't breathe, you're gasping for air and you're uh, and the asphyxia. And so again, it immediately tells you, wow, this was here, I had not noticed it. But your consciousness, your idea that you have a body and the mind that is in that body is coming through those operations that are very quietly in the body. So this actually helps me make one comment that you will find interesting. Most of the theories about consciousness tend to focus on high level processes. And when people started to really worry about the problem of consciousness, they said, well, consciousness is such an elaborate, complicated thing that it must come from the very top of our brain. It's the, the very top of our intellect, of our cognition, that is giving us an idea of what it is to be conscious. This couldn't be more wrong. It's exactly the opposite. That's why I'm concentrating on things like feelings of existence. It really is very important. It comes from the bottom. It comes from very simple uh, processes such as feeling. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that they're simple. From very basic uh, processes such, such as feeling. And the reason why is that they are so important for life regulation. So it couldn't be something that came late in evolution at the last minute to make us more glorious and intelligent. It's something that has been there from very early on. Once organisms had nervous systems that could help guide life. And here again, I'm going to say something that I want you to remember. The reason for consciousness, the reason for being conscious is to be able to guide our life such that we can survive and, if possible, survive with well-being. 
it, it, it's not to have great intellectual manipulations. It's just to tell you when, by temp, body temperature, where you breathe, uh, or by other feelings such as hunger or thirst or pain, that something is needed. Something needs to be treated, something needs to be managed in your body, or you're going to get sick, or you're going to lose life. That's that simple. That is the reason for consciousness to be. It's to regulate our life. It's not to make us brilliant intellectuals, brilliant writers or, or artists. Okay, very good. So let me see. I covered so much that I need to find my slides that tell us about what I'm going to say next. So uh, again, in contrast to the feelings of existence, the other feelings that I talked about, such as hunger, thirst, well-being, malaise, pain, nausea, I call them regulatory feelings, okay? Um, now, what these feelings do is that they help us generate experiences of our own organism. And that is really the core process that is going to maintain our consciousness. We have the possibility of experiencing our body. And when you experience our body, we also have the possibility of grounding our subjectivity. We realize that this has to do with us. This is to do with something concrete. It's my body, not your body. It's my feelings, not somebody else's feelings. So um, the conclusion that I would reach at this point is that consciousness is a state in which the continuous presence of homeostatic feelings reveals the owner of the organism by naturally connecting mental processes with the respective organism. So you have the two things coming together, the body and the, uh, the, the mental events that are in your mind. So consciousness is a state in which the owner self is indicated by the feeling process and which affects the multi-channel perceptions of the organism situation in the environment. So, of course, you're getting that, that uh, uh, minding around that we do with extraception, with senses of, from the outside and give us an idea of what the world is like. And then you have to combine that idea that we get of what the world is like outside with what the world is like within. Uh, and that the world within is the world that is coming through feelings. Okay, now, uh, I would like to give you an idea of how this happens physiologically, because there are really two big problems that we have to unpack here. One is the problem of what consciousness is and whether or not consciousness is useful, which means what it does. That's what I've done so far is tell you that consciousness is about the creation of these feelings that locate mind and body, and that exist to give you warnings, to give you advice on how to run your life. And that's why they are spontaneously conscious. In other words, there's no way you can, I mean, for you to ignore pain, you need to be under anesthesia. For you to ignore hunger, I don't know what you do. I'd probably fall asleep if you can. Uh, these things are there, conscious, present, pushing you to do something. Now, how does this come about? Because that, not only has there been contention on what consciousness is, but there has been plenty of contention on how is it that a biological creature manufactures consciousness. And so we need to talk about the physiology of consciousness. So, here it's very important to say well we do have nervous systems um creatures that don't have nervous systems such as plants trees you know they're very complex very complicated biology goes on in maintaining trees alive plants alive for long periods of time um so 
it's not just about life. It's about life with something particular, which is nervous systems. And so it's obvious that uh, th there have been nervous systems for a long time. There are plenty of organisms that have nervous systems. We humans have happened to have the nervous system that is both most complex, and clearly we are conscious. I'm conscious, you're conscious, we're here having this conversation. But it doesn't mean that it's we alone. There are plenty of animals that have consciousness. In fact, uh, I would venture that uh, all the primates um, clearly have consciousness, all mammals, all fish. Uh, I think that in all probability, insects have consciousness. Um, and they are actually incredibly interesting creatures, uh, such as, for example, octopuses that do have consciousness as well with a very complicated brain that actually has different parts. But at any rate, what I want to say is that consciousness appears in living creatures that have nervous systems and that beyond a certain complexity of nervous systems, you get consciousness. You don't need to be as complex as you are to be conscious. That's why your favorite pet, your cats, your, your dogs, obviously are, are conscious. Um, but uh, you, you need to have a certain degree of complexity. Now, the other important thing is that when people uh, think, well, how do, you, how do you get to be conscious? And people say, oh, well, because you have a nervous system. And very often the statement suggests that you have consciousness because you have a nervous system and the nervous system is it. The nervous system does consciousness for you. And what I want to leave you with is the idea that this is not correct. And what we have brought to this field is the idea that you need to have a partnership between the body and the brain in order to create consciousness. You need to have the two together. And it's the two together with certain parts of the nervous system that allow consciousness to emerge. And here I will tell you about something very specific that we know now through the research. And that when you, you, you really have ways of bringing information from the body to the nervous system and uh, information from around to the nervous system. So for example, right now I'm looking at the translator, I'm looking at myself on the screen as well. So there's a visual image that is being created by my retinas and my eyes and I'm bringing signals to certain parts of the cerebral cortex, which are related to vision. And they create an image with the color, the movement, the shape, everything that is in it. Uh, and uh, if I touch my desk or if I touch the, my notes here, I can touch the, the paper, uh, that is fine. And there's a certain amount of temperature that is uh, in, the, in the room that is also being uh, transmitted by signals to the, the, the brain. Now, when it comes to the body, and, and by the way, those images that I have in my eyes, in my retinas and then in my cerebral cortex, are the result of neurons, nerve cells, that have a particular kind of structure. And that happen to be, in terms of evolution, rather modern nerve cells, rather modern neurons. And one of the things that they have that is very interesting is that the exons, that the fiber that connects with the next neuron, are insulated by myelin, uh, which is a protein that makes th that function very much like a cable, like an electric cable that insulates and does not let current leak. Uh, and that's an operation that, to make a long story short, is going to allow our neurons, our nerve cells, to operate a little bit like a digital machine. Uh, in which you, you you have sort of zeros and ones, you're active or you're not active. And you create our incredibly rich mind thanks to that operation of those very modern neurons that are in the very modern cerebral cortex, okay? Now, what about the body? 
how do we get impressions that, for example, I'm hungry or, or I have pain uh, or I am feeling well? Uh, that comes through another kind of nervous system where the neurons have an axon that is not insulated by myelin and therefore is leaky. That, that uh, axon can be attacked by a synapse coming from any other neuron. And because it's not insulated, it allows for something magic, which is a co-mingling, a co-connection, a, a very intimate close connection between what is part of our body and what is part of our brain. So whereas I'm seeing you and you're seeing me with this very sharp, uh, you, by using these very sharp neurons, very insulated, working, you know, in full modern technology perfection, the information that comes from my body comes from these very old fashioned neurons where the axons are literally mixing, commingling with our flesh, with the state of our interior. And that's why molecules, chemical molecules from the interior can connect with those axons and can give you an idea of how your body state is. And how do you get that idea? Through feeling. You get that idea, the, the feeling well or the feeling sick, the feeling hungry or the feeling thirsty, all of that comes thanks to those very simple neurons that are all over our entire body, our entire flesh, and are bringing into the nervous system signals about how life is being lived. Isn't this beautiful? It's great. So you bring all that information from the body through nerves. They go into spinal ganglia. They're all along our spine. They go into the spinal cord, or they go into a big nerve called the vagus nerve. Again, totally demyelinated, 90% of the, the, the axons. And that goes into the brain stem. And the brain stem, which is so, it, you know, on top of your spinal cord, but before you get to the cerebral cortices, before you get to the thalamus that is underneath. And what those, uh, if that region of the, the brain stem does is integrate, bring together all the information that has to do with the state of the body. And lo and behold, it is exactly in those nuclei of the brain stem, in the back of the brain stem, um, that you have the concentration of information that has to do with our body and the information that really uh, gives us the feelings and gives us our conscious state. The rest, the things that come from the outside, are going to benefit from that because if you have this brain up to the brainstem that allows you to be conscious because you have all these feelings, then when you look around uh, or when you touch things or when you smell things, you can connect those perceptions of the world around with the feelings of your body. And at that point, consciousness is being given by the feelings of the body and is allowing you to know if life is being lived well or not so well, if you need to apply care to what, what's happening in your life and do something. Uh, so, you really, one could summarize this by saying, look, we really have three brains in operation here, or three mental functions. One that comes all the way from the body, everywhere in the body, into the spinal cord and the brain stem, and it translated in the form of feelings, qualities, wellness, or, or, or badness of your life process. Then, Everything that comes from the exterior and that invades the cerebral cortex uh, through our senses. And then within that cerebral cortex, you have a possibility of operating in one of two modes. One mode, which is externally directed, which is what you're doing right now and what I'm doing. I am concentrating on you, you're concentrating on me, 
and we are receiving all this information from the exterior and you're making all these visual images and you're translating this internally and you're committing many of them to memory with the help of a structure called the hippocampus. But you have another mode, which is when you pause and you're thinking about yourself. And instead of paying attention to what's being told to you or to the, the radio or the television, you are actually looking within and thinking about yourself. We call that mode the default mode network. And that is the source of our thinking about ourselves, the source of our generating an idea of who we are as a self, who we are as individuals. And it's something, you know, it's like a ping pong. Throughout the day, you're constantly moving from one to the other. Right now, because you're in this lecture mode, you are totally tuned to the outside. But uh, when you pause after this and you're, you're quiet in your study, you may be thinking about it. And when you're thinking about it, you then go into this mode, which is reflexive uh, and it's the thinking mode. And it's very interesting because just so that you know, the areas of the, the cerebral cortex, for example, that are engaged by one or the other are different too. So you sort of switch, you turn from one to the other. So um, I think we're going to just quickly summarize and say, you have consciousness because you have homeostatic feelings. Those homeostatic feelings are spontaneously conscious. You have such an abundance of them that you are conscious because you have all those homeostatic feelings. But you also have a way with your brain to look out in the world and learn about that world by creating perceptions of every kind and putting together a notion of what the world is. And finally, you have a way of reflecting on all of that uh, when you are in your thinking mode. And these modes of operation have different languages. The language of feeling is the language of qualities and intensities. The other language uh, is a language of external perceptions and a language which is what we call language, verbal languages, or in your case, uh, sign language, in which you are translating signs or translating what things are in your mind into a specific kind of sign. Uh, and that has its own arrangement, its own uh, syntax, uh, its own way of maintaining the course of, of, of thinking. Um, that's what I wanted to tell you, and I'm going to stop. And if you want to ask me questions, I, I would be very pleased to consider them. And if I can answer them, I will answer them. Thank you. Thank you so very much for your talk. Beautiful very interesting and fascinating to listen to um, for me i don't know if other people have this experience but i was very excited to have the opportunity to meet you my background and training i had a required reading ah. <laughs> that i think the majority of neuropsychologists at some point had to encounter this text and read about and think about that. And so it, it was very important for me. Um, I read it again more recently when I had more time to digest it, but I very much wish that I had more time, more time to reread it. Thank you. So I see we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. We also have, I have a few questions, but I can't um, dominate the conversation. So see who we have from the audience first. Very good. So we can either have, invite people to come up and express their questions on their own, or I can read the questions. Um, if people would like to come up on screen, if you use the raise hand feature, then we'll give you access to turn on your camera. I see Dr. Quant. 
uh, wanted to come up. Uh, Dr. Quan, do you want to come up and sign your question yourself? Let me just give her permission to come up. Go ahead, Dr. Quant. Excellent. Thank you so very much for your presentation today. Um, gave me a lot of food for thought. My question that I put in the in the Q and A box was, would you mind sharing an example of something you encountered which significantly changed your mind about the nature and conception of consciousness? So maybe a case study or an experiment or another theory, what's something that really caused you to rethink and shift your understanding? Very good, excellent question. Well, uh, I think that in general, I was very much shaped in my thinking by observation of real human beings that were victims of particular areas of damage in their brain. So I could say that most of what formed me as a thinker about brain and mind comes out of studying literally dozens of individuals that as a result of strokes or as a result of surgical removal of areas of the brain had certain defects. That is extremely informative. Um, first of all, because you're dealing with human beings that have a problem, but in the rest of their functions are maintained. And they have a possibility of telling us about what the problem is, what is missing. Uh, so th that is shaped my thinking in general. Uh, in relation to consciousness in particular, was actually the realization I was uh, I was finishing a, a, a book that uh, is called Feeling and Knowing. Uh, and I was describing feelings and I wrote a, a, a sentence, I said, this feeling is spontaneously conscious. And I suddenly wrote that, which in fact I have written before. And I said, my God, I'm really stupid. So if the feeling is spontaneously conscious, why would you be trying to find consciousness from somewhere else? You know, you have it right there. So you have the possibility of, of learning from that. And that's when I started. So in, in, in that book, I did not develop. It's very interesting because that book was written during COVID. And I remember distinctly that at that point, I didn't have the conception that I have today. In other words, there were lots of things that were still the same, but it was, that realization that all of these feelings that we have that have to do with our regulation of life are spontaneously conscious, whether it is a fever or hunger or pain or thirst uh, or the, the, the feeling of well-being that, that we have, that's right there telling us the state. Because you know, it's interesting, very often we think about the negatives. You know, most of the when, when you have feelings, what you tend to emphasize uh, is the hunger, the thirst, the pain. Well, that's all negative. But what about the feeling of well-being? The feeling of well-being, the very important one, and what it does is that it gives you license to explore the world. It must have been very important in evolution. So right now, when you have a feeling of well-being, uh, we're just happy that we have it end of story. But think about it in evolutionary terms. And suddenly, an older version of ourselves in the jungle, instead of uh, being worried about feeding or being worried about pain, is feeling well. So you could go around and explore uh, uh, other settings and discover new sources of food and so forth. So all of the feelings, positive and negative, 
are spontaneously conscious and very important that way. Thank you for your beautiful question. Thank you. Next, we have another person who had a question. Um, I don't know if they want to come on screen or not. Madeline Williams. Let me promote you to panelist. I think she has two questions. Start with your first question, and then if we have time, we'll proceed to your second question. Hi, um, so my first question was that first mode that you had mentioned, um, the second mode that you had mentioned, you said that was our default mode network. And I was just wondering if that first one was then the executive control network. Is that what you were meaning by that? Yeah, the, 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 that's one of the terms that is used, but it's really, I like to call it the extraceptive mode because it, you know, it just pulled out into the world. Yeah, but go ahead. Okay, yeah. perfect. Um, and then my second question, if I can just shoot that one out, is that you had said that every organism with a nervous system with a degree of complexity has consciousness. Can you explain that degree of complexity? Well, uh, you have to be a bit more specific about, about what you want. I mean, well, the, the, the complexity, uh, the, that nervous system needs to be complex in the sense of First of all, having these modes of operation that I've just described, certainly the extraceptive and the interceptive, uh, and then the possibility of generating in a central nervous system an equivalent to the things that are going on in the periphery. And that, uh, for us, happens actually in the brainstem. So it's in the brainstem, in the, in the back part of the brainstem, that you have the possibility of representing uh, the wellness or the badness of our physiology. And it's very interesting because that's the part of the, 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 the brainstem that when it is affected, for example, by a stroke, produces what is known as coma. And when you know the, the, the sort of magnum example of a human being uh, losing consciousness in a pathological way as a result of disease is having a stroke in the back part of the brainstem and it produces coma and in the majority of cases uh, people don't recover from that because these regions where you're having the construction of the quote unquote the image of your own body that disappears so once you're deprived of that you know your your, your mind it's sort of operating in a vacuum because uh, actually, I, I never thought of describing it this way, but operating in a vacuum actually is a very good example because you, 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 you have lost the foundation and the reason why you have all this, which is the living body. So if you think of consciousness as a, a, a function, as an operation that makes possible the continuation of life in your body, then you realize that if you lose the way of representing that, you're gone. Then all of this stuff that we gather from the outside and they can cogitate about is meaningless. It's just not, it does not have a foundation any longer. Thank you for your question. May I jump in to this topic? When you mentioned the person in comma with a mind without a body that gives them consciousness is operating in vacuum. Mm -hmm. Is the body the difference between human mind and artificial intelligence? Yes. Very simple, very deep question, very simple answer. Yes. Uh, I, I have my conviction is that it will not be possible artificially to create a mind that is like a human mind. The reason being because you don't have, I mean, what is it for? <laughs> that's, that's the question that we should ask. And um, it is one thing to have uh, artificial elements that are you know, fine from the point of view of engineering. They can operate very fast. They can give you enormous power. Uh, look at all the power of communication we have today. We, with, with phones or with computers. All of this is very important and useful for our lives in many ways, 
although it comes with a lot of problems as well. But what they don't have is the issue of life. And life is very important because you, you have this, uh, this need to maintain it. It's something that is not there uh, and will stay there like a, a stone or a rock or a machine that can be left, can, can rust, but basically it will stay the way it is. We have life that is constantly, inevitably at risk. If we don't manage our life, we get sick and we die. That's the, the very important reality, which very often is forgotten. And when people start talking about mind as if mind would be something literally out of body and unconcerned with body, then they don't realize the beauty and the risks that are involved here. And of course, you, you can say that there are other ways of making minds. Of course, you can, you can construct can construct a computer operation that is artificial and that operates like a mind to a certain extent. But that doesn't mean that it is a mind. It's not. Mind is in, involved with, uh, with life and mind is involved with the risks for life because life is there to be maintained and it's imminently risky unless you take care of it. It's not something to be left to its own devices. Thank you. We do have one additional question. Okay. And I just wanted to see if Hilda Germundred wanted to come up and find their own question. If not, that's okay. I'll go ahead and read it for everyone's Wow, thank you, Dr. Damasio. Yes, I see they're asking to read it. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Damasio. In the beginning, if I got you right, you said that homeostatic feelings are different or separate from emotions. How is that? What about the defense system, like the flight, fight, and freeze? That might make me scared, mad, shocked. Is that not related to the homeostatic system? Very good, excellent question. <clears throat> So um, if you think in terms of evolution, the likelihood is that homeostatic feelings and feelings in general, but homeostatic feelings in particular came first. And they came first, again, because of the answer that I just gave, uh, there was life and there's the need to regulate life. Then as organisms became more complex, organisms became capable of communicating with other organisms using, for example, something as emotions or um, indicating to uh, other, well, that is communication to other organisms, communicating internal states. But those internal states that have to do with emotion, when you think, for example, uh, clearly joy uh, is an emotion and it's expressed very intensely, not only in the body, but in the face. Um, but look, look at anger, for example. That's something that came clearly later, long after nature had been spending its time uh, curating the problems of life. There was this situation in which one organism, as a result of the action of another organism, could react in a way that attacked the other organism. That's what anger is about. Or the situation of fear in which suddenly you have an organism that does not know what is coming ahead, but has some indication, whether it is a sound or, uh, or something you see, uh, smoke, for example, that will make you be in fear. Those, all of those uh, um, emotions are clearly part of the large homeostatic regulation of an organism, except that they are, they came later in evolution at a point in which there had been already a lot of relationships among individuals so that you could develop these, these specific cores such as fear or anger or joy uh, or love 
uh, those were things that were, were developed along many uh, eons of evolution uh, in order to make life better. So your point that emotions are part of homeostasis is absolutely correct, except that uh, we normally, when you think about effect, and when you think about feeling, we first think of emotions. Why? Because we are emotive beings and we are in the thrall of emotions the entire day. Uh, things are either going well or not so well, and we have interactions that are constantly using emotions, and we have a lot of interactions that, of course, use our face, and our face is an incredible uh, place, a, a place that is both a mirror of what is going on in our minds, but also a theater, because you're expressing yourself and doing lots of things with that face. But this came later than the homeostatic feelings that I talked about first. And of course, they had to be first because there was this imminent problem to take care of, life. And that's, that's where we are. But of course, they're part of, they're, they're, they're part of the same evolution of effect and they are part of homeostatic regulation. You cannot do without them. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a, a few more questions. Those who join our Distinguished Lectures series know that I always have a few questions. At the very beginning of your talk, you mentioned uh, the, dis the fact that consciousness is inside our body, is internal and not external. So, of course, the first thing that came to my mind is what about those patients who claim to have out-of-body experiences? What is happening to consciousness in that situation where patients claim to be outside of their body and perceiving the world from outside? Anything you can tell us about that? Yes, I can, I can think about several interesting things. Uh, one, out-of-body experiences, as far as we can uh, understand and know, uh, are not regular, normal ways of being. So we're talking about situations that are, uh, the best way of describing them is pathologic, in the sense that an hallucination is pathologic. So in, if I now all of a sudden see uh, um, the figure of a man dressed in red in the middle of my study, uh, that's obviously not a normal perception. It's something that my brain would be fabricating, and that would be pathologic. And there are conditions in which brains can do those things. We also have something very interesting that we know today, which is that because we have modern technologies that allow the study, for example, of human beings with electrical stimulation. This is something, for example, one of my great students uh, is a young man by the name of Yosef Parvizi. Um, he was my doctoral student uh, in the MD, uh, PhD, and he works at Stanford, and he is a big expert of epilepsy, state, states in which people can have seizures, and he can put grids of electrodes on the surface of the cerebral cortex that don't cause any damage and that can pick up on the electrical activity of different brain areas. And this is very important because you can define the area that's the problem and that opens the possibility of treating it, sometimes even with surgery of that particular area. And one of the things that he finds is that when you go into certain areas with electrical stimulation, people have exactly those kinds of out-of-body experiences. So suddenly you are inducing in the brain a state that is not the habitual state and strange things like that happen. Or the person will say, oh my God, I'm just completely, I'm, I'm next to myself. I'm outside of myself. Uh, and so what is, that is telling you is that the regular function of those areas in the brain is being distorted by the abnormality that is there or by the electrical current that you're sending. And as a result of that, you get those 
situations which are obviously not known. So I think that this answers your question. We're dealing with a, a neuropathological phenomena and phenomena that today we know we can reproduce in the laboratory. And so that gives us an idea of how it comes about. It's no longer a complete mystery. It still has its mysteries, but not a complete mystery. So I, I noted my one comment. Uh, you mentioned the partnership between the different parts. So it's basically a partnership that's not working well between the different yeah. parts. It's yes. a mismatch between. Yeah. Um, and then um, I have also put it down that you mentioned um, the three uh, the three systems, mm -hmm. uh, the homeostatic emotion, the external, and then uh, the, the, the the reflective one. The reflective. So internal talk mm -hmm. is you mentioned something briefly, but I I think I miss it. Where do you put internal talk? Because it's not just homeostatic. It's not just the body. It's not outward. It's not, but it's not also the connection between the two parts. So where where do you think that? Yeah, it's, it's it's very interesting. That that's part of the the default mode network. And so it's different regions of the cortex with the predominance of the mesial regions, the, the regions that are internal. So when you look at both hemispheres, uh, you have the outside of the hemispheres, it's called the lateral aspect. And then you have each hemisphere looking at each other, literally. And it's on that internal surface that you have the regions that switch and suddenly dominate the process when we are reflecting. So after we finish this talk, I stop for three or four minutes to think about how it went and what I should have done different, uh, which I will do. That is gonna be done by switching my cerebral cortices from, for example, the visual cortices that are all operating in full capacity to another cortex that is known as posteromedial cortex in this in mesial and in front of the visual areas. And that and a variety of other mesial areas will then operate. So you switch from looking at the outside and you're literally looking inside. But what is and the conversation that you have with yourself, uh, whether you actually talk or you are just thinking about that conversation, that's mediated by those regions. And all of that just like with the outside, is still going to go into the hippocampus so that you can create memories about it. And so that in the future, that moment of reflection that you had can contribute to your consciousness of the outside world and to the, to the next reflection that you have. Thank you. Now you know everything. Almost. <laughs> There's, it's incredibly interesting. But at the same time, while you're talking, I'm also thinking and having all these thoughts and trying to either understand and assimilate what you're saying and test it with things that come up to my in my head and yeah. trying to say I'm both outwards and inwards at the same time. And that's very distracting when I'm trying to understand what you're saying, <laughs> reasoning on the process while yeah. trying to learn about the process. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's really a sort of ping pong. And, uh, you know, we don't have the luxury sometimes to to be in one mode pensively or in another. You know, you have to go back and forth. There is uh, one more question. Um, Christina, raise your hand if you want to uh, be spotlight, to have spotlight. Yes. Oh, I think you are a panelist already, are you? No, let me make you... Uh, Promote panelist. And we'll take us. There we are. I'm thinking, by the way, I'm thinking about, I'm going to listen to you, but I wanted to tell you about the homeostatic feeling that I just felt. <laughs> and that is hunger because it's lunchtime. <laughs> I just wanted to give you an example <laughs> of how you can. <laughs> <laughs> how we can bring homeostatic feelings into this lecture in a very real way. Uh, but please go ahead with your question. Um, Christine, if you come back on camera. She disappeared. 
Oh, there she is. Hello, Dr. Damasio, and thank you so much again for a wonderful presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. So a good final question. I don't know if there are any others, but I'm wondering with all of the research that you've done in this field on consciousness, what do you predict would be the next new frontier in consciousness research? Thank you. Uh, well, there's nothing more <laughs> difficult to predict in the future. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, well, I think that something, well, the, 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 uh, your question is very, a very good one, and, and there's several aspects that are interesting. One is to do, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fundamentally a scientist, but I began my life as a neurologist. And, uh, and I don't think I would be the scientist I am today if I had not been a neurologist, because that gave me the possibility of seeing human beings in situations that are quite irregular. They're not the, the, the everyday situations. One of the things that I think we have a chance of improving is the way diseases of consciousness operate. Uh, and if we could do something to alleviate the risks and the, the awful conditions of coma uh, and related disorders. That would be something that I would like very much to see happen. And that's part of the future of this science. The other uh, is to do with a clear demonstration of the relations between biological minds and minds in artificial intelligence. And this came up uh, before. And uh, you know, my conviction, as I said, is that it's not going to be possible to make artificial minds that are like our biological minds because they lack life risk, all of, all of that situation. But I could be wrong. And so one thing that I'm sure we will see in the next few years is a very devoted uh, effort by people who believe that it will be impossible to have artificial minds that are like the biological ones, and that will go for that. And, and we will, I think we will be part, if we're alive, uh, we'll be part of that, of that research. And uh, so that answers your question. On the one hand, try to use what we know now to better treat and manage neurological disease. And on the other, uh, answer this fundamental question: Is it really possible to go into a different, uh, into a different mode of consciousness that is like ours, and yet it comes out of completely different hardware? Uh, and and that's a very open question. And it will be very important to answer that. You know why? Because right now I can understand how a biological mind can have ethical regulations. Um, I don't. I don't see how an artificial mind is going to have ethical regulations because our ethical regulations are all hooked with the idea of pain, suffering, and wellness and well-being. If they don't have wellness and well-being because they don't have a life to begin with, how are they going to regulate moral behavior? Because our moral behaviors. Even things that have to do with truth or lies uh, or, or, or being kind or not kind to another person, all of that has to do with our life and how we feel it. That's the beauty of it. But so if there are artificial intelligence computers that, that are 10 times faster than I am uh, reading uh, or thinking, that doesn't mean that they're going to have the, mo the moral foundation that we do. So that's, I think that's a very good way of ending our story. Okay. Okay. So um, we, do you want to close here? Do you feel? I, I yes. think that after the, after the moral foundations, you cannot go anywhere else. Okay. We thank you very much. When hunger calls, sometimes it's too distracting and we cannot <laughs> be outward and have to be inward. Thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining today.
I will switch back to ASL to close. Um, Thank you everyone for joining us today. It's a pleasure to see everyone here on this webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Damasio. I mean, I know that you have such a busy schedule and I can't tell you um, how much of an honor it is. So thank you so much for coming here to Gallaudet to present. And we appreciate the opportunity to be able to meet you and learn directly from you, uh, having the interpreters as part of the talk at the same time. Thank we wish you a good rest of your day and hope you enjoy your weekend. And maybe you. we'll see you at some point in the future. Absolutely. When we have new things, you can Thank you. come and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful Thank rest. You. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Sorry that we needed to close. If you have other questions for Dr. DiMaggio, um, I will say if anybody you know wants to have a chat with me, I'll be here for a few more minutes. Uh, please do make sure that you register for our next presentation. Here is the QR code. You can take a picture of it right now. Good to have an easy access. I see people are still here at the webinar. Anybody else have any questions? We have a few more minutes with our interpreters as well. So. All right, if not, I want to thank everyone. Thank you to your interpreters, both L'Oreal and Mark. Thank you to our captioner, and we apologize to everyone for the technical issues with captioning today. So I'm going to close the webinar. Bye, everyone.